how to care for a Bigfoot. You must walk him, feed him, Knitter. Filet of bird. show him who's yeah. boss, and you'll have a unique vow. <laughs> Harry and the Hendersons. Today at 10 on KOK, Fox 25. Okay, I'll take him back. Why is it that most movies revolving around Bigfoot just aren't very good? Hey, look out! It seems like they try too hard to be either silly or serious. You can't stay here, okay? We can never be friends. It's gonna never work. Just go home. Go back to where you came from. There are a few exceptions, though, and one of the best, if not the best, Bigfoot movie walks the line between silly and serious pretty well. Harry and the Hendersons. Though the plot of the movie is a little ridiculous, centering around an American family accidentally fostering a Sasquatch named Harry, he didn't care for the blue shoes. it's made all the more memorable thanks to a fun performance by John Lithgow. Uh, exercise, I mean. That's the only diet. <laughs> Plenty of energy right here. And an amazing makeup design by Rick Baker. Baker took a piece of legendary American folklore and managed to reinvent it with a friendly, charming persona. Shit! <laughs> that could also be scary if needed to be. The character design of Harry became a great marketing tool for the movie, which included toys and other merchandise. The film was a moderate box office success as a result, opening at number 3 on June 5th, 1987. I grew up watching this movie constantly, as it seemed to have a permanent home on cable TV throughout the 90s. So decades later, when I discovered a Harry and the Henderson sitcom had aired beginning in 1991, I was shocked I had never seen it, or even heard of it for that matter. And then I watched a couple of episodes. Oddly enough, the Harry and the Hendersons movie was originally intended to be a sitcom. The story came my way through a, a guy named Bill Martin, probably one of the best comedy writers I've ever worked with. And he and his partner, Ezra Rapoport, had a, about a 25-page sitcom script called Harry and the Hendersons. And their intent was it to be a half-hour series. But I basically said to them, I think this is a bigger idea than a sitcom. I think that we should explore this as a movie because no one has taken the kind of look you guys took at Bigfoot, where he could be a lovable soul. He, he could be a very innocent being. Unlike a lot of sitcoms based on movies that I have covered before on this channel, the Harry and the Henderson sitcom was pretty successful in its own right, running for three seasons with 72 episodes produced in total. Like the movie, the show was produced by Amblin and Universal, and aired in syndication from 1991 to 1993. The rip-off network. And then it just vanished. It's hard to find someone out there that actually remembers watching this show, or even has a knowledge of it existing. It doesn't help that there has never been an official DVD release, and it's pretty hard to find episodes online, with most of them being in pretty poor quality. Though surprisingly, it seems like the show was pretty popular in Germany, resulting in the best quality versions you can find online. Ernie, hör auf, ich hab jetzt keinen Sinn für Blödsinn, komm sofort raus! <gasps> oh, oh my god! god. While most of the movie's cast did not return for this spinoff, Harry himself did, with the show reusing that same impressive Rick Baker design from the movie. So having never watched this show but being a fan of the movie, I want to take a look at just some of the episodes you can find online, to see if it stands on its own or if it just feels like a bad imitation of the movie. So let's check out Harry and the Hendersons, the sitcom. And don't worry, if you're not familiar with the movie, the sitcom's theme song, a version of Your Feet's Too Big, sung by Leon Redbone, sums up the premise pretty concisely. Where'd you get them? How'd you get them? Way up north in a house that's new There were four of me, your big feet and you From your ankle up, I'd say you sure is free From that down, you just too much feet Your feet's too big don't want you cause your feet's too big I love you even if your feet's too big 
It appears that the first key difference between the movie and the sitcom is here the Hendersons live in a more rural area, as opposed to the suburban Seattle of the movie. As such, the first episode is basically a remake of the movie's plot, retelling the events of the movie in this new world. Well, I took his pulse. It's nothing. Dead. Deceased. And this is a late animal. Therefore, this show isn't really a follow-up as much as it is a remake. Come, don't make any sudden moves. I'll handle this. Stop! I... him mine! Ernie! Uh, you... give... Ernie, me! The tone of the series also differs pretty drastically from its predecessor. Can you, can you put that back? That's a genuine Tacoma Indian pillow there. <laughs> For example, in the movie the reveal of Harry is really slow building, and is initially a little scary for the Hendersons, before he warms up to them. Here, from the very moment Harry is revealed to the audience, he's immediately made out to be a bit more clumsy, hitting his head on the lamp. <laughs> These two starkly different introductions to Harry remind me of the Always Sunny episode where Mac fantasizes about him scoring a goal at a hockey game, versus what actually happened. <laughs> I also love how the audience seemed generally awed by Harry upon his entrance. I mean, he's still really impressive to look at, even 30 years later. <laughs> Harry himself required three performers. Someone in the suit, a puppeteer controlling his face, and a vocal performer for his sound effects and vocals. <laughs> There's just so many components that went into the performance that it's amazing it all came together so fluidly, especially on this sitcom. Number three. Number three. And this is the most important. <laughs> he can stay. Oh, wonderful. Here's a clip of Rick Baker explaining how the character's face was puppeteered. These joysticks here are, these four joysticks operate the lips, this being the upper lip. These two being the upper lip, and this being the lower lip here. These little brass pads here change the brow expression, which is something that enabled us to have one operator control an entire face, where in the film it was three puppeteers. It gives you a clue in just how difficult it was to manage. Between all the individual facial movements and the sheer size of the costume, it's just great to see it return instead of them using a cheap imitation. Go back to where you came from. Okay, this is your only chance. You gotta take it and run. <laughs> the actor in the Harry suit also returned from the movie. While you might not recognize his face right away, 7'3 actor Kevin Peter Hall specialized in playing some of film's greatest monsters, including the original Predator and Harry. Sadly, Kevin Peter Hall died towards the end of the first season and was replaced by Dalwyn Scott, and later Brian Steele for the show's third season. Watching this show after re-watching the movie, the overall tone and humor in this sitcom just feels way closer in style to ALF than of the movie. I mean, the plots are pretty similar, too. A family consisting of a mother, father, teenage daughter, and younger son accidentally find themselves fostering a strange furry creature on what is supposed to be a temporary basis but they fall in love with this creature and his silly antics, and he becomes a part of the family. Oh sure, draw parallels! As a result, the show becomes a lot like your standard 90s family sitcoms, with the same forced family tension. But then there's a Sasquatch right in the middle of it all, and it just doesn't really work. <laughs> He ran away! Do you think so? You see, having this series focus around a Sasquatch really limited where this series could go. In the handful of episodes I was able to watch, I swear 90% of them take place in the same living room set, as they really couldn't take Harry outside of the house. Because, you know, he's a Bigfoot. What are we gonna do about Harry? <laughs> 
They tried to work around this, and there was one episode in particular where they use Harry to fight as a masked wrestler in a charity match, where no one suspects he's a Sasquatch. You're a wussy! You can't call my pal a wussy! Wussy, wussy, wussy! <laughs> I should also point out there's this recurring element throughout the show where Harry daydreams constantly. A lot of the clips I've used that show Harry dressed as a human come from these segments. But they kinda end up ruining the pacing as they come out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> This is the type of ridiculous humor that the movie tended to avoid. There's another episode where a monster movie director, played by Pat Morita, discovers Harry and tries to make him a movie star. But then, of course, he changes his mind with your standard sitcom moral lesson with its own sad sitcom music. The only thing missing is the awe from the audience. Aww. That seems to be the problem with a lot of the storylines on this show. Even if an outsider character or guest star was brought in, the show would end with them agreeing not to bring attention to Harry's existence. There's another example where Ken Griffey Jr. and Sr. show up for some reason. Well, there's no lock on the door. Now, Ernie, do you have a chair up against here? It must be stuck. You want us to help? Yeah, would you? Just push it right here. I'm holding it closed. Damn, pretty strong kid for ten. <laughs> I guess the creative team behind the show eventually realized that they had to work around this, and they had Harry discovered by the public during the second season. From there, the rest of the show revolved around Harry dealing with his newfound fame and acceptance as a member of the public. So we could get charming scenes like this. Again, it's really hard to decipher the plots of the later seasons, but it looks like at some point Harry's wife or girlfriend Yetta shows up. Which really just gives me Star Wars holiday special flashbacks. Is this all a big hello I get? <laughs> I remember as a kid how hard the end of the movie hit me. Where the Hendersons finally decide to return Harry to his home, the movie ends up being about them letting go of Harry so he can return to his own family. And even the Bigfoot hunter realizes he needs to let Harry go. It's just a great ending that really ties up the movie. But isn't it much better to retcon all of that for scenes like this? <laughs> Something's the best done in private. A lot of these late 80s and early 90s sitcom adaptations seem to think the only reason the source material was a success was because of its premise alone. But with all of these great 80s movies, there came a distinct charm in the casting, performances, direction, and writing that just could not be recreated, especially in a sitcom format. There is no greater proof of this than with Harry and the Hendersons. The director of the movie, William Deere, was really smart and recognizing that the idea behind Harry and the Hendersons really only could work as a movie. Trying to stretch the concept behind Harry and the Hendersons into a three-season, 72-episode storyline just really spreads the premise thin. Though it's nice to see the actual character and his design return, the writing in this sitcom doesn't justify it. It definitely deserves to be forgotten, and I can see why few people seem to remember it. Unless you live in Germany, where it was inexplicably popular. So to close us out, here's the German version of the theme song. Ich 
im Norden, in einem Haus im Wald, wohnt ein Bigfoot, eine haarige Gestalt. Seit er da ist, ist den ganzen Tag was los. Er hat ein gutes Herz, nur seine Füße sind zu groß, sind viel zu groß.